and I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see everybody. Let me welcome everybody, in fact. Welcome everybody to the Future Transform. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a couple of great guests, and we're talking about an incredibly important subject with some great research, and I'm really looking forward uh, to our conversation. We began the Future Trends Forum in February 2016, and every year, in fact, almost about every month, we've been paying careful attention to online education, how it works, what technologies support it, what pedagogies make it function, what data do we have about it. This has obviously been a subject of a great deal of interest. Now, today, I'm really excited to bring in two authors of a report on this subject. This is the famous Chloe report. If you look at the bottom left of the screen, you should see a button that says Chloe 9. You can click that, and I'll take you to the free PDF that explains all of that. And then, uh, now, the two folks involved, well, let me just bring them up. Nothing like Sinovich and Neil Swati. Let me just bring them up one at a time. Should have a drum roll right here. So, can... <laughs> Bethany Simonich, greetings. Greetings, Brian. Thank you so much for having us. And and one quick correction: it is Richard Garrett, not Neil Swidney. Wow, wow! Yeah. I thought that was an odd typo. <laughs> My apologies, man. I will I will correct that, and I will I will apologize in person. But speaking in person, where have we found you today, Bethany? I am in Ohio. Yes. And the wall behind me is blue, but it's coming across as white. So it looks like we're in the same room, Brian. <laughs> it really does. You're just down the street, you know. Yeah, it does. It does. Well, uh, I should ask the most important thing, which is, uh, is autumn settling into Ohio? Have the leaves turned and started to fall? It is. Uh, I'll probably be raking some this weekend. Yes. Very good. Very good. Leaf cardio. Well, nothing- <laughs> Leaf cardio. I like that. I like that. It sounds like a, a Viking uh, exercise scientist. <laughs> uh, um, well, you know, we have we have this tradition on the forum where we ask people to introduce themselves by talking about what they'll be doing next. So I'm just curious, looking ahead uh, for the next year, what are the big projects and what are the big ideas that are top of mind for you, Beth? A lot of good research going on. So uh, at, at Quality Matters, we're doing some great partnered research that's in the works. So we've been partnering up with uh, D2L to do some good research on LMS templates and how that could be a good faculty resource, good resource for scaling. We're working with our senior research colleague uh, on some targeted research related to online programs. Um, Yep. There's not a lot of really good research on online programs. There's some good data, but there's not a lot of good research. So how do you develop uh, a really good, high quality online degree program? Um, We're going to have a second uh, white paper come out in a series looking at um, uh, equitable use of AI, especially in online courses. And me individually, I've been working on a model that really looks at the landscape of online learning within an institution. So I call it the Quail Quality Assurance Implementation Landscape. I've been doing a little uh, tour of some uh, some conferences around that, but I should have a paper out about that soon. So a lot of research going on. Oh, and one more thing, we have a COLO research uh, separate from Chloe. So I worked with Eric Fredrickson, who is a Chloe co-author and our in-house COLO, uh, and also uh, Julie Uranus from UPSIA on that. So we're gonna be- Yeah, good public webinar coming up um, in December, December 11th on that. So about the role of colos and UPSIA um, worked in their colo competencies. So that should be a really good conversation and thought that'd be of interest to your audience today. And colo stands for Chief Online Learning Officer? Yes, thank you, yeah. Oh, very good. Um, I was afraid it was gonna be cost of living. I had to be very careful. (laughs) That's that's an incredible amount of work. Wow, Uh, good for you. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 please please keep me posted so that I can share this work as it progresses. Absolutely. Uh, Thanks. And uh, in, in the meantime, let me just uh, bring in your uh, your wonderful colleague. Uh, hang on one second. And this is the announcement for Richard Garrett um, with his proper name and a very dramatic background, Richard. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> you described it as uh, a dark abyss. A few minutes really ago, is. which is not how I think of it. It's just my, it's my nice basement. It's got a nice wooden ceiling, stone walls, but I'll have to rethink Dark Abyss. Oh, 
I, I find Dark Abyss is very comforting myself. Uh, and, and although this does look like a bit like a computer game back then. So, you know, behind you could be a monster, right? Well, let me know if you see one. Uh, we will. It'll be too late, but we'll do our best. <laughs> okay. So, Richard, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. What what are you going to be working on for the next year? Are you going to be working with Bethany and all these projects, so colons and OPMs and all, or are you working on something else? Largely something else. We'll, we'll continue to collaborate on Chloe, but uh, some of the things I continue to be interested in, I use the uh, a survey from the Census Bureau called the Current Population Survey. That is a large monthly survey of US consumers on all manner of topics. And we've sort of hacked it to come up with a near to real time enrollment rate ratio for US adults. And we control for prior education and age and other things. And it's it given us, we, we came up with it during COVID because everything was so unclear as to, well, was this going to be classic counter cyclical, the economy is terrible, enrollment will go up or, or something else. So we were tracking it versus the same month in 2019 pre COVID, but it's proven very useful as a way of going beyond the more lagging metrics from iPads or from the clearinghouse that, that aren't, mm answer real time or a more occasional so we can get month over month estimates for the proportion of americans within a certain demographic frame or prior educational background that are enrolling in college or university and we can get it you know the most recent data we have right now is september 2024 so it's very real time so all that to say we are intrigued by the long-term decline in adult undergraduate enrollment. You know, lots mm -hmm. of institutions are interested in some college, no degree students, but the, but the deep trend is about one third decline over the last 10 years for mm. all kinds of reasons. And we're wondering whether with more attention from institutions, given that the traditional age population is about to shrink the, the, the famous demographic cliff, whether that will stir some more demand or whether sustained low unemployment aging society will mean that we're never going to get back to those those levels of, of enrollment. And then we can do it for graduate level as well, which is we've been used to that growing. But if you control for the size of the underlying population, the graduate enrollment rates actually been going down, meaning fewer people eligible to enroll actually do enroll even hmm. though the headline enrollment's been going up until recently. So we, we, we regard that as a very interesting way of helping our clients understand in more real time what's going on in particular markets uh, relative to some of the more backward looking data that everyone pays attention to. I would, I would love to cite some of this data for the book I'm working on. Um, can I follow up with you on, online? Please do, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, this is terrific. Well, here, let me rearrange the screen a bit so that we all uh, seem a bit more cozy. Um, and uh, and say thank you both for, for joining us uh, for this hour. Um, friends, uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, uh, the Coin 9 link is there in the bottom left. Uh, it's a quick you know, register for a, a free PDF. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our authors a couple of basic introductory questions. Uh, and then it's going to be over to you. So whatever questions you would like to put to our authors, Again, think about what if you'd like to join us on stage. I mean, clearly you either have to have a blank white or a dark background, but the other backgrounds are allowable too. Um, or you can type it into the chat box or to the Q&A box. Uh, so well, one question I, I have for you is, it seems that uh, based on a number of findings, it seems that the demand for online learning continues to grow based on your survey of chief online learning users. And it seems that a slim majority of those programs are actually cash positive. That is, they're making money. Uh, uh, would it be right to say that you're sketching out a, a likely continued growth of online learning? I'd, I'd say yes, but, but with some caveats. I think there's no question that pre-COVID, whether we're talking about adult undergrad or grad programs, most obviously, but also to some extent, traditional age undergrad, we were seeing steady increases from different starting points in openness to enthusiasm for online. And then the pandemic 
was a very confusing period, but I think it, online emerged better off than it would have been otherwise uh, in, in, in so far as exposure, people weighing the pros and cons, but ultimately exposed to something that they otherwise weren't exposed to. I think it accelerated yeah. that emphasis. Yeah. And, and now, based on what we're hearing from Colos, chief online learning officers, there's a clear sense from the majority of them that they're still running to catch up with that growing demand. And given that the, the sleeping giant in the online space has been the traditional age undergrad who embraces the online course, but not the online program, hmm. that I think is, is, is causing the most sort of ructions uh, insofar as that population was, was the mainstream, campus oriented, dependable, not very interested in online in any major sense. And I think there's still a lot of truth in that, but I think there's a growing openness to forms of hybrid, if you know, we use that term for want of a better one, and it covers a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. But so I think it just depends on what we mean by online. I think courses, hybrid, I think those have a lot of runway. If we mean fully online programs in certain fields that are already quite mature, it may be harder to find those those extra students, uh, harder to launch programs and and still get a great return. I, I would say absolutely, because nothing can top that flexibility of online learning. And as, as Richard was saying, <clears throat> I think a lot of students experienced something during the pandemic where it shifted their thinking that maybe online is a good option for me. Right. So institutions are responding to that increased demand. Students are continuing to vote with their feet. They are enrolling in those online courses, even if they are campus based students. I think, uh, you know, again, to Richard's point, looking at traditional age undergrads, which was a, a demographic where we didn't see as much interest and enthusiasm, especially for online degree programs. You are seeing that now, uh, especially uh, uh, new. Um, research and data has come out for uh, community colleges and you're seeing an increase in online uh, demand for community colleges as well. So I think all these things, all these data points are really pointing to the fact that uh, sustained demand, increased demand in the future. And, and again, I, I think part of it is that flexibility. Even if you're an on-campus student, you want a uh, hasten time to graduation. If you're trying to further your education graduate program, micro-credential, what have you. You don't want to relocate. You don't want to leave your job. Online, you know, affords that opportunity. So you both mentioned uh, a difference between online classes and online programs. I think what you're describing are students who take the majority of their classes face-to-face, -face, but will take one or two classes online. Uh, what's, if, if that's right, what, what's the model for that? Do they take classes that their local physical campus doesn't offer, or are those remedial classes, or what? It's a good question. I don't think we know enough at a national level about that because the data, the federal data, at least in iPads, simply says you're either fully distance, you're some distance, which is anything from one course to multiple courses, but not every course, and then and then zero distance. So what we, I suspect what's going on is the average number of online courses per student is going up within that some online category and probably the variety of courses is going up. I suspect the majority of them are being taken at the school where they are enrolled, but certainly taking advantage of summer classes or parallel classes or in the winter to meet particular needs or get access to something and the growing number of consortia, institutional consortia that are all about sharing online courses that but we don't have good data on the detail of all that. But I think it, I'm sure the average is going up. And given that the average institution now offers uh, a multiplicity of online classes, it's probably trending in favor of those institutions keeping those dollars in house. Mm -hmm. For the past two sure. years in the, in the Chloe reports, uh, chief online officer online learning officers were saying, yes, we are investing in online courses, secondarily online programs. Um, and to echo Richard's point about quality and course sharing, I think there's a deeper interest in that. And I think institutions are also recognizing we may not have to develop everything ourselves. We may lean in on our own expertise and partner with institutions that have similar levels of quality. Uh, QM happens to have a webinar right now going on about quality and course sharing. <laughs> 
So check out that recording. Um, but it's it, uh, we're doing a little bit of data collection on that as well and uh, starting to offer an institutional recognition because institutions are trying to, again, lead into their expertise and then leverage some of those partnerships to get students uh, the curriculum that they need. Uh, I remember back um, when uh, when MOOCs first exploded, uh, we had you know programs like EDX, uh, Future Learn, Coursera. Uh, what are some of the more, for your money, some of the more successful consortia or collaborations for online learning now? Well, I think Coursera does stand out as successful insofar as it's continuing to grow. It's got a very sort of stellar stable of of partner institutions it's got probably as many programs as anyone else and it's got this nice continuum between still some free provision mm -hmm. uh, guided projects i think is the term they use you know very discrete application development of skills you know all the way through to degree programs often at very attractive prices and with an increasingly global presence Another one I'd, I'd call out on the on the course sharing side would be uh, the the rise education effort that mm -hmm. is a I forget the exact details but essentially it's a it, it stems from Adrian College I think in Michigan their president Jeffrey Docking a few years ago arguing that institutions like Adrian small private liberal arts colleges in you know, far flung parts of the country and not the best brands need a variety of strategies to thrive and online being one of them but but arguing that as bethany said rather than each institution try and reinvent the wheel wouldn't it make sense if like-minded institutions shared resources and you could yeah. build best-in-class programs across the consortium for for yeah. per institutional costs that would be much lower than otherwise and and i you know those those efforts i think have to deal with institutional culture that's very much uh, you know not invented here and all mm -hmm. the challenges of, of credit transfer and recognition and faculty preference and so it's by no means plain sailing but i think they they've definitely attracted a lot of interest a lot of institutional participation i think we still need a little more time to pass to judge exactly whether they are overcoming some of those cultural roadblocks but mm -hmm. i think i think it's the right approach to take in a you know, constrained environment on various levels. Thank you, thank you. That's a, that's a really good answer. Um, friends, I, I have more questions, but your questions are already coming in. So I'll, I'll defer over to you. Um, this is one from our uh, good friend in Malta, Phil Blingard, uh, who asked a question about completion rates. Here, I'll put this up on the screen. What is the trend in online completion and success rates compared with in-person education? Well, it's a, it's a great question, and it it depends to some extent how you define these things. But mm. what we've done at Edge Ventures, for example, is leverage a couple of different sources. So nowadays in iPads, we're beyond the only being able to track first time, full time undergraduate student completion and outcomes. We can now track outcomes for other kinds of undergraduates who are part time or not first time, you know, come in with some some prior credits. And then again, we try and hack the system because you can't explicitly connect modality to, say, part time status. But mm. you mm. can see by institution what proportion of, say, undergraduates are fully online or fully distance. So we came up with this sort of categorization of institutions by online intensity at undergraduate level and then mapped, mapped that to pro uh, I guess I'm talking program completion now but program completion mm -hmm. rates uh, at the undergraduate level and you definitely continue to see and this is consistent with the wider literature a on average net negative association with online learning meaning mm -hmm. the more online intensive the institution typically the lower on average the completion rate there are some um, wrinkles in that if you take full time, not first time students, the classic adult learner who is recognizing the benefits of studying full time rather than part time, even if they're juggling work and family. Those students, if they study fully online, don't 
outperform everybody, but definitely outperform, uh, say, part-time online students or first-time full-time online students. So I think we have to weigh, yes, online learning because it's non-traditional, because it often in a typical asynchronous model demands more of the average student than a, a conventional social in-person environment. And because online, we found over the years, disproportionately appeals to less traditional, more vulnerable students with less educational capital in that sense. And so they, they absolutely value the convenience because they struggle to think how could they enroll otherwise. But that often means they're least well prepared to thrive in that environment. But mm -hmm. if you are you know, right. a little bit older, you're studying full time, you've got some experience behind you, it's a high quality online program, then online, I think, can can definitely hold its own. So you, you got to weigh all these different variables. Yeah, and that's what I was going to respond with. I, I don't think it's as much about the, the data for completion rates. I think it's about the interpretation of that data. So as, as Richard was saying, you, you typically have a very different demographic of student that is going to take an online uh, program or take more online courses. Uh, they tend to be, you know, in, in some ways, uh, as Richard said, more vulnerable, but less prepared, um, less affluent. And those things really do make a difference when it comes to, to completion. Uh, the other thing is, you know, especially, uh, you know, since the pandemic, when we see this huge increase in online programs, we see a, a marked increase in online courses. Not all of those courses and programs were developed as high quality courses and programs, right? So even your traditional institutions that may do campus-based learning very well, that doesn't mean it automatically translates into doing online very well. And so when students then engage in these programs and then the institution may not have the right learner supports for online students, and that's you know something that we talked about Chloe 8, Chloe 9 as well, that's mm -hmm. still lagging behind. Those things affect completion rates. They affect student success. And so this needs to be a packaged conversation because otherwise it becomes, I think, a conversation of uh, online is lower completion rates. Therefore, online you know, is not good or it's not as good as campus based learning. And that is just not the full picture at all. It's 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 much more nuanced than that. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, as usual, you ask a really, really good question. Um, and, and thank you both for, for responding. I can easily imagine, and I've actually heard of, of faculty saying, well, you know, what we need to do is we need to pull money out of online learning and push it into improving face-to-face -face instead, or into offering more face-to-face -face instead. Um, and this is, a, if you're new to the forum, by the way, that's a Q&A box question. So you can follow Philip's footsteps and just go into the bottom of the screen along that white strip, hit the Q&A button and type in a question. Now, the other thing you can do uh, is you could uh, instead um, ask a question on video, and we will have right now uh, one such questioner from Meryl Krieger. Hello, Meryl. Good to see Hi. you. Good to see you both. Thank you both so much for this. And as someone who's been teaching online for some 15 years now, and is now also an instructional designer, I really appreciate the complexity of the conversation we're having because this to me seems so much more relevant to um, both the opportunities and the challenges that online learning presents for us. And I think I wanna get back to one of the elephants in the room that I think you've both been speaking to, but I would love to invite you to, to address it directly, which is um, we've got this decline in enrollment going on and we've got these all these conversations about the convenience and the part-time student issue. What do we, do you have a sense for what people are doing instead of going to college? Interesting. Yes, so at Edge Adventures, we did, we've recently developed a companion survey to our survey of prospective students. So that refers to every year we survey high school juniors and seniors and traditionally, we've always filtered out those who essentially say, I'm not going to college mm -hmm. because we wanted to focus on those who were going to college. But the trends that you mentioned meant that we were starting to get questions from institutions saying, well, who are these people who, who don't end up in the survey? What, what do they think? What are they doing? You know, they, 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 they think they can't afford college. They don't understand college. They think it's no, no good for them. You know, what is it? 
so we we created a companion survey for uh, called essentially non-college bound and try to understand attitudes motivations directions and and, it, and it's and i don't have the exact numbers in, in my head but the, the the range is there's definitely a portion who say i absolutely want to go to college but not now because i'm i have other pressures on my time obligations i don't think i can afford it i just need a break from formal education but there's definitely a, another group and i think a growing group that is questioning college on a more fundamental level and saying that you know we've somehow put college on a pedestal and said it's the only way to have a successful life pursue the american dream people starting to say well I, I know too many people or i've read too many stories about people who have not completed and taken on debt and ended up working in a non-college job and you know and some of that's you know rumor and and hype but some of it's you know real connections and stories and, and, and relationships plus i think this growing disconnect between you know, our economy clearly benefits from a highly educated citizenry and workforce but highly educated needs to be broken down into into a variety of things that that speak to the breadth of our economy and our society and i think as a nation as as institutions meaning higher education institutions have drifted towards aping the most you know research intensive and selective institutions we've lost that perhaps stronger historical connection to more you know applied trades etc and i think that's where the the economic tension is i don't think many companies are saying we just can't find enough college graduates uh, there are almost too many college graduates and, and hard to differentiate where we are struggling with is is particular skills and and certain trades that are aging out and we don't really have as a nation a good policy infrastructure response to that so i think that plus we've got sustained low unemployment we've got an aging society this idea that you need college to distinguish yourself from the mass of people scrambling for too few jobs i think that's yesterday's problem not tomorrow's problem so colleges i think are in a in a tricky situation where they can't just rely on ever bigger cohorts more people graduating from high school you know the cohorts are getting smaller almost everyone graduates from high school and there's now this growing array of alternatives and more and more policy muscle and and rhetorical muscle behind them apprenticeships etc so i think it's it's a it was you know it's probably foreseeable and, and inevitable but it's for anyone who's used to higher ed as always getting bigger and always getting more support you know it's a very different scenario to to work in so i think i think that that, that non-college pathway is growing it's real it's often very rational and colleges need to figure out you know what's what's the response i i think one of the biggest questions today is the roi of college education and i think prospective students the american public in general is asking that question in a way that they never have before um you know and and, and to richard's point uh, some some students are you know going into trade schools more applied programs we're seeing more applied programs move online partially or fully um you know and trying to give that you know that additional flexible option to students even if it isn't in a, a traditional college setting uh, or university setting um some are postponing you know because of the the economic the financial factors you have reduced funding and increased costs but i think really looking at that return on their investment if if i'm going to spend four years in this if i'm going to spend an immense amount of money is mm -hmm. that am i going to see a payoff you know when i go into that job market or do i have a trajectory in employment without this um, I, I haven't yet seen the same shift on the employer side, maybe a little bit, but not as much. So I, I think a lot of things, you know, the perception, just the faith in higher education, things are shifting now. And I, I think it also calls higher ed institutions to make a case in a way that they haven't been asked to before about that investment, um, maybe strengthen those things like career placement services, um, connections to professional organizations. So making students sure students have something when they graduate, is there connected portfolio work? Uh, you know, things that could be embedded during that, the, 
their their educational tenure there that would make them more attractive uh, upon a graduation aside from I got my, my degree. Well, Meryl, what do you think? This all makes a lot of sense um, from where I sit. I'm an instructional designer for a fully online asynchronous program aimed at working adults, and we are an applied program. Um, I have taught both in community colleges and in a public university, both on a traditional campus and on a commuter campus. I've seen this range that you're talking about. So everything you're saying really resonates. Um, and I agree, I, I would say that the students we get through, because I teach in the program that I'm also a designer for, I have my own set of courses that I teach. And our students are coming in, um, asking for what jobs they're gonna get at the end of the day, but they're also, and in fact, I just had this conversation yesterday, but they also come in, um, in my experience, with such a wide range of interests and backgrounds that that's almost an impossible answer. So one of the things that we try to talk about is how can you apply what you're doing now? And this is where that conversation with employers comes in and this conversation around skill set development and expertise comes in. And this is where, uh, to my mind, the ROI conversation can happen really effectively, but it's not a big scale, it's not a big level, systemic, scalable kind of conversation. So I guess to me, that's the mm. dilemma. And I don't, and I don't know the answers. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you. Um, uh, you if, if, if we don't have the perfect answers, we definitely have a splendid question. Yeah. Meryl, are, are you uh, actually in uh, Philly right now? Or are you off? Yeah. Hello from the crosstown. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you for the great question. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. And thank you all for such thoughtful answers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I concur. And, and friends, if you're new to the forum, that's obviously an example of a video question. So if you'd like to follow Meryl or join us on stage, you can tell we're very friendly. And having a beard is clearly just optional. Um, just raise the, <laughs> click the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we have uh, more questions. And I wanted to share one that came in from a, a longtime Future Trends Forum um, supporter who is actually in Florida today. So he thoughtfully gave me his question ahead of Hurricane Wilson. Uh, and this is from Glenn McKee, and he said, uh, I have to read this, uh, Western Governors University was fined $713 million for not meeting RSI standards, but the fine was waived by the Department of Education. Can you tell us what RSI standards are and when they first emerged, where can they be found? And most importantly, why RSI is not part of the accreditation process for online delivery? Shouldn't the membership association require the members to meet at RSI standards and have the Department of Education enforce them? Thank you. So RSI stands for regular and substantive interaction. And I don't know that we have time to go into the full history of it, but uh, uh, very long story short, what it really uh, tries to attend to is making sure that there is that good interaction between the, the professor and the student, um, especially in these online classes. And so there are federal policies around it. Um, it's, it's what helps to distinguish a distance learning course from a correspondence course. So those old time courses where you had to you know, mail things in, I don't know if anybody remembers those, um, where you didn't have that interaction right between the instructor and, and the student. Um, this originally arose as protections for online students. So online students would enroll in these programs and they were billed as distance education courses and they ended up being more of that correspondence course type, right? And so, you know, this uh, federal government stepped in and said, really students are signing up for this particular type of educational experience that has parity with the on-campus experience and you're, you're not giving that to them. You're giving them this educational exchange change where, you know, again, there isn't that interaction. So um, <clears throat> there, there are guidelines. I can't say that there are strict definitions for this counts, this and this doesn't, but there are things that do not count. Um, in general, though, you know, when I have this conversation with faculty, I try to spin it away from the federal guidelines and instead ask the question, why wouldn't you want to design into that course and teach that course, these opportunities for interacting with your online students. So it's something that needs to be thought about proactively. 
especially in asynchronous online courses, which is still the predominant online modality that we see. It is still the number one ask from students because again, that flexibility. So you need to design interaction into the course, especially if all that direct instruction in, a, in the form of, for example, videos is there beforehand. You need to design in opportunities for interaction presence, et cetera, and then that carries on through the delivery of the course. So uh, WCET has a lot of good information about this as well. I want to you know, point your, um, your listeners to that. Um, what else should we talk about for, for RSI? I mean, I, I still think that it's, we asked about it this year in, in Chloe 9, and one of the things that came out was that institutions, um, you know, they talked about RSI policies, not all of them provided support to faculty in meeting RSI. Oh. And more than that, very few of them actually evaluated whether or not online courses met RSI policies. So, you know, it's, it's kind of similar to quality assurance. A lot of institutions will have standards, they will have guidelines, they will talk about it. But when it comes to the actual assurance part, and that's the part that matters to students. That's the part that really makes that difference for student learning. I think we're still dropping the ball there. So um, guidelines are great, but I would add to that assurance, uh, you know, as to the question, why isn't this built into accreditation? Um, that could be a very big conversation. I would say in some ways it is. And, and if you are, you know, doing the things that you should be doing, um, and meeting those standards for your accrediting body. Um, and, we, you know, again, we see parity with this in, in quality assurance. You really need to go that extra step and not just meet them on paper, uh, not just meet them in spirit, but meet them in terms of how it matters to student learning and student success. So I think this is something where institutions really need to have deeper conversations and also deeper and better support for faculty in understanding what RSI means, why it's important, and what happens on that student end when those policies aren't met. And building on that, I think Thanks. the question I referenced Western Governors University, because I think that was a okay. classic example of what's right and what's maybe not so right about the RSI arrangements. So RSI goes back, as Bethany said, as a way of trying to decide which kinds of distance programs were eligible for federal student aid. And once online learning came along, and at that time, if you were a fully online institution or doing a fully online program, it was very hard to get federal student aid. But as online started to grow in popularity and was seen to be interactive in a way that say correspondence or other forms of distance learning historically were not, it, it pushed the conversation and essentially online programs, online institutions were allowed into federal student aid because they were seen to match this campus-based norm of regular substantive interaction, which you know essentially assumes that the face-to-face -face model of the students and the faculty member is the norm, is the gold standard. A school like Western Governors, which was built to contradict many of those assumptions in that it's competency-based, it's direct assessment, it's individualized learning, it's assessment of prior learning, it's a lot of interaction student by student with customized materials and exercises to develop them, meet them where they are, where they're trying to get to. And the idea that you've got a traditional faculty-student relationship and that doesn't really, bode, doesn't really stand up. And I think that's why we had this odd period where the, I think it was the Government Accountability Office decided that, uh -huh. well, clearly Western Governors is flouting all these rules. We must find them all this money. And then uh, an acknowledgement that, well, actually, this is a very innovative institution. It's been around for a long time. It's very popular, very successful. It's pushing the boundaries in ways that we probably want them to do rather than constrain them to this traditional metric. So I think RSI is, is a useful guidepost to good practice in general. But I think the reason it's not enforced in some sort of uh, legalistic way is that there's lots of different variations on what a good online course or good student experience look like. And it's often faculty student mediated, but it doesn't have to be. And, and I think that's, that's why yeah. I, I, hopefully it's a creative tension between some sort of anchor to avoid bad practices or, or 
weak experiences, but also not something that's a straight jacket that ties us back to an ideal that may be going in the wrong direction. And Brian, I, I think that's an important point that Richard brought up, that part of the WGU case was that they they were innovative and they, have a, they had a different model. And sometimes newer models, you know, when they're trying to fit into more traditionally uh, founded rules, you know, you see a mismatch there. It doesn't mean necessarily that there was that lack of interaction, but because of their model with you know, the student success or academic coaches interacting with students, in a different way or an additional way from faculty student interaction. Um, so, uh, you know, in some ways those students were very well supported, but in other ways it didn't match up with that traditional higher ed model of it is only the faculty and the student interacting, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 you know, again, we have to be really careful with these conversations about online because without the, you know, the nuances and the complexity brought to bear, I think the takeaway can be, look at these big online institutions and they're not interacting with students and they got fined, et cetera, et cetera. And that really was not the full picture there. Oh, th this is this is fascinating. Uh, for, first of all, Glenn, I've got to say thank you for pouncing on the RSA finding. Folks, if this is if RSI is new to you, we just had a quick introduction to it. Um, and the Chloe report spends some time taking a look at RSI, which is where Glenn uh, gets the question. Uh, and I, I think this is fascinating to see how we have the, the application of face-to-face -face modalities, assessments, and evaluations, and extending that online. In the chat, Tom Haynes says we have to be careful not to reproduce the face-to-face -face classroom online. Otherwise, we have, as he puts it, the horseless carriage for them. Mm -hmm. Also in the chat, I just want to have a shout out to uh, Kristen Cash, who uh, she answered an earlier question, uh, which is that in her experience, she's seeing lots of young people, especially young men, going to the trades. And then she also shared a wonderful link to uh, a University of Lynchburg uh, professional development uh, site. Uh, quick shout out to everyone in the chat, or a quick question, rather. Uh, would you mind if I uh, exported the chat and saved it with uh, names uh, blanked out? Just let me know in the chat. Oops. Um, and Bethany and Richard, what a great nuanced, detailed answer to this question. Um, I love the way that Chloe takes us so much more deeply into understanding uh, online learning. Uh, but I'm conscious of time. Uh, it's 2.48 here in the East Coast, and we have several other questions in the queue. And I'd like to give uh, one of them uh, to our dear friend, Philip Long, which just proves that you couldn't be named Philip. I have a question here. Uh, Philip asks, is there an association between the propensity of online courses today being more job focused versus liberal arts or scholarly interest? So, you know, are, are more online classes more, you know, educational, uh, more skills oriented, or um, as opposed to being more liberal arts or more uh, scholarly? I, I don't know that that there's you know a, a general pattern that, that you can see there and I but I think there's a distinction between online courses and online programs in terms of online courses I think you see a wide representation for type um, especially because again some of those campus-based students they want that flexibility and that comes in a lot with those general education courses right mm -hmm. so your, your gen ed science you know your liberal arts courses things that your college and university students need to take a lot of them are moving online um, because you know the, so many students have to take them you have high enrollments etc however when you look at online programs we have seen especially an explosion in graduate programs and over half of those are at the master's level i think those are targeted more towards those um you know adults who are working professionals they want to you know advance uh, in the workplace, but they're not going to geographically relocate. They don't want to, you know, do that traditional go back to school. So you have these these online program models that have been working for adult learners for years now because they're designed with the with the adult in mind. You know, that's typical weekend warrior. In a lot of cases, they had that carousel approach, so adults could concentrate on one course at a time in a more concentrated mm -hmm. format while they're still, you know, working 40 hours a week. And so I. I think those those demographics help to support developing online programs again especially at, at the graduate level that were more applied i mean so the, the i think the highest number of online uh, degree programs is mbas nursing programs so they are very practical in nature they are applied in many ways um i think this sort of you know push to, to have some online options 
again, especially at the community college level, for undergraduate students, for you know, a more general liberal arts education. We saw a rise in that after the pandemic, but traditionally that was not a strong you know, demographic for institutions. So I think part of it is the history of online coming to bear. And then when you add the, the increased demand since the pandemic, you know, we we strengthened um, you know, that connection to practical and applied programs, especially at that graduate level. Um, but you, you know, you still see, I think, a smattering of, of types across courses, though. Yeah, I mean, interesting. I think I agree with all that. But one one challenge that's come from that for us at EduVentures is we've tried to come up with what we call adult or graduate student mindsets, meaning hmm. how to how to segment the market by you know, aspiration, outlook, priorities. And we model that on our traditional undergraduate student mindsets that do break out. You know, we have career pragmatists, we have experiential learners, we have people who are all about you know purpose and meaning. We have grad school bound people. You know, you, 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 there's some pretty intuitive approaches to the value of an undergraduate education for a for a high school senior. But the challenge we found for adult learners and graduate students is that it's very hard to break apart this career monolith, this, this idea that the only reason I'm going is because it's going to give me this edge in my career. Mm -hmm. And I think schools are running into this as a challenge insofar <clears throat> as every program is convenient, flexible, adult oriented, career oriented, even if the institutions are rather different. It, it, we haven't yet found a way to bring in more nuance and variation into the online student experience that might help break apart this monolith because if, if if students just say well i just want i just want you to give me good roi i want this to be applied and relevant and convenient and get me out the door as quick as possible i mean that's fine but if you've got hundreds of institutions essentially trying to play to that they can't you know how do you differentiate do you just have to spend more than everyone else in marketing and that's how you win or your brand is your halo brand is just better because you're an R1 versus a you know a, a less known private institution. Mm -hmm. So I think there's this interesting vicious circle where schools don't want to appear inconvenient. They don't want to do anything that smacks of you know high-minded thinking or you know scholarly interest for its own sake. You know because they think well, well we'll lose. No one will enroll in our program. And equally, students then think well if I even allow myself any smidge of, of interest that's not career, you know, maybe I'm shortchanging myself and not being rational. And and it's the, the market is becoming sort of monolithic in that sense. And I think it, it plays into the fact that then, well, if if the priorities are speed, convenience and relevance, maybe the degree is not the best vehicle at all because it's inherently long and expensive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pushing more and more consumers to say, well, wait a minute, maybe I don't need a degree. I, maybe I can get this essence that I need some other way more efficiently. So institutions are almost undermining their own assets and, and differentiation by going further and further down this instrumental approach to, to, to higher ed. What's, what's the outcome? But what's the end result of that if we do that for, say, five or ten years? Well, I, I think it will shrink demand for degrees you know partly it's underlying demographics etc but but i think if if you ultimately push the degree into a more and more instrumental frame then the degree itself starts to be in tension with that because a, d a degree is not inherently uh super efficient and super rational you know it's supposed to be about you know, higher order thinking and time to reflect and, and a sort of a place apart from the pressures of the world. And online is is enabling degrees to become more accessible, you know, and maybe that's a creative balance. But if every 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 degree is essentially just as convenient as possible and as instrumental as possible, then uh, you know, schools can't differentiate and I, arguably students are you know missing out on perhaps the the timeless quality of a broad-based university education which is precisely its adaptability to the unknown and if, if nothing else right now we're we're confronting the unknown so 
you know, it, it, maybe it's back to the future. You know, maybe we'll, we'll, things will become convenient to the point that we say, wait a minute, this is, this is actually not what we, not enough return on investment. We need something more than convenience. What we're getting is convenience and nothing much else. Um, uh, so thank you for the, for the really, really good question. That Bethany and, and Richard, what a great deep answer for this. Um, I love how uh, on the forum that we managed to switch from very, very detailed questions, you know, like you know, on the side you know, of details, to questions about the fundamental nature of education uh, and how this works. But we have uh, we have time for one last question, and this is from uh, Jeff Alderson at MathWorks. And let me bring this one up because this takes a, I think, a, a bit of a different question. Uh, he asks uh, about uh, sponsorship. Do you see increase or trends in online graduate programs that are co-sponsored between companies, typically science or technology, and universities? Hmm. I mean, I would say that that approach has been there as a niche arrangement over the years, but I think it's rare to find a, a meeting of, of needs and and assets that last over time and is sort of bigger than the sum of its parts and and doesn't distract from the core business for the company say so I, i'm not i i have not seen some sort of boom because i think too often those ifs and buts get in the way but insofar as you know this again this theme of, of relevance and, and applicability to the workplace and companies often feeling like they're not quite getting what they want from generic degrees without mm -hmm. their their direct input you know I, I do I, I think it makes sense but but equally it, can, it it's inherently niche insofar as it's you know if the company really wants it so tailored to itself, then, you know, unless it's a massive company willing to throw lots of cohorts through it, you know, it's hard to justify the investment for the school. And then if it's, if it's broader applicability, then it's, you know, it's harder to say, well, is, is this undermining our competitive edge from the company's point of view? You know, you can look at Google's various certificates speaking to their core business, but they've largely designed them you know, as the company and they use institutions as a vehicle to, to grow enrollment. But, I think it's about ensuring a, a, a trained workforce to that know how to use Google products essentially. So there's there's an ROI from from their point of view, but I think most of those arrangements tend to be very niche, behind the scenes, hard to scale. That that's my sense. Yeah, I haven't seen an increase in those collaborations, but one related data point from Chloe is when we asked about some top priorities. Uh, in in uh, Chloe 9, 46% of our chief online learning officers said expanding employer partnerships is a priority for them. So a okay. little bit different focus there, but it's it's still a focus on connecting you know, with employers and making sure hopefully that those program outcomes, for example, are aligned with employer needs. Uh, and when that's not the case, you know, making making revisions to make that more applicable and relevant. Yeah. So I think the distinction is. Yeah. I think what Jeff's asking about is, you know, jointly designed programs for some sort of right yeah. business need. Whereas I think what Chloe, you know, what you're talking about, Bethany, is the idea of a sort of B2B to B strategy. Let's market this program right. to employers. They'll they'll push their cohorts through, they'll subsidize the tuition, but the program remains, you know, fundamentally a generic program. And that, yeah. you know, that model is super convenient, I think, for the school and the company if there's some sort of alignment. But it often lacks the customization that sort of drives Jeff's question about, you know, we need something tailored to us that's going to give yeah. us the edge. And is that worthwhile for the school? Yeah, I just haven't seen that as much, though. So, right. yeah. Well, that's so interesting. Uh, I mean, just 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 thinking about again, we come back to some of the scaling issues, but also in uh, in the chat, uh, Phil Long adds the uh, corporate collaboration is a strategy of industry certifications. He points to Google, IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, AWS, etc. But that's that's the opposite of customization. I mean, that is yeah, I like think that's the companies that's the companies seeing right. curriculum credentialing as 
as sort of supporting the core business and and, all, and often bypassing institutions, you know, doing that, doing it on their own, or just institutions are a vehicle to run their curriculum rather than some sort of deep collaboration. So that's a, you know, that, that's a different animal. It is indeed, but um, I hate to say it, but we are all out of time for discussing this and other animals. Uh, we have somehow raced through an hour uh, in, in your company, Bethany and, and Richard, and you have given us so much to think about. Your, your Chloe reports, and this is why I brought you back, is because the Chloe reports are so important, but also because the two of you behind the report have thought so broadly and so deeply. What What's the best way to keep up with the two of you? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's probably the, the the simplest option. And we have, you know, we have the Chloe site on the Edge Adventures page, the QM page, and there's okay. ways to reach us through those two. Right. Yeah. Definitely LinkedIn. Um, but uh, in terms of webinars, uh, virtual webinars, conference appearances, and all those things, uh, QM homepage really lists where I'm I'm at and where other uh, QM people are at. So hopefully. I'll see some of you at conferences, if not a virtual webinar this year. Uh, like like today's. Um, in the uh, in the chat, uh, Barbara uh, shared uh, a link to the Chloe 10 survey. Uh, so uh, if you're a chief learning officer, um, you can uh, take a look at that. Um, and uh, she also added uh, research at qualitymatters.org as an email address. Bethany, Richard, thank you so much. Good luck with Chloe 10. We're going to have to bring you back next year, this time next year, once Chloe 10 comes out. Thank you so Sounds much, good. Brian. Really appreciate Thanks, Brian. it. Brian. Yeah, appreciate okay. everyone's questions. Take care. Take care. But don't go away, friends. Let me just quickly uh, uh, point out to where we are, uh, where we're headed over the next two. And and thank you again for the uh, fantastic questions. If you'd like to keep talking about this, if you, you know everything from customization, RSI to um, certification and more, uh, here is where I can be found in all the social media places. Just use the hashtag FTTE and you can ping me at Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky, not to mention my blog. If you'd like to look into our previous conversations, including our previous hosting of our Chloe authors, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you'd like to look in ahead uh, to our upcoming sessions as we cover still other topics, including enrollment, the right to learn, reform and grading, an election scenario, educability in the future of libraries, just head to the forum's website at forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again for all the excellent questions uh, in the chat box. Thanks, everyone, for contributing so much. I'm going to archive that right now. Uh, I hope everybody is safe and sound. If you're in the Florida or American Southeast area, please, extra wishes for you being safe and sound. Uh, take care, everybody, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.